Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. So my talk this afternoon is about the next section, main section of the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, which for, is about mind and mental formations. And the first part of the instructions uh, about contemplating the mind given by the Buddha in the Sutra, or Sutta, uh, proceeds as follows. One knows a mind filled with lust, to be a mind with lust. But one knows a mind without lust, to be a mind without lust. Or one knows a mind with anger, to be a mind with anger. Or one knows a mind without anger, to be a mind without anger. So these things are registering in mindfulness. There are states that we have. They may be lust, they may be other, other types of mental formations, but it's the registration, the acknowledgement, the, the knowing in a mindful way that is what matters here. One knows a mind with delusion to be a mind with delusion. Or one knows a mind without delusion to be a mind without delusion. Or one knows a contracted mind to be a contracted mind. Or one knows a distracted mind to be a distracted mind. Analoyo writes, although in what follows, in what follows for him, I will be talking, talking, uh, taking up in detail the individual states of mind mentioned above, at the outset I would like to note, Analoyo says, that the main thrust of the present contemplation can be summarized as a continuous inward monitoring of the question, how is the mind? So that we have these, these mental states as kind of guideposts, but the, we're looking around the guidepost. We're looking at the whole area of the mind and considering how is the mind? Whatever may happen outside, which is where all our attention usually goes, becomes secondary from this perspective. What really counts is how the mind reacts to it. This is what we need to keep noticing. It is such knowing of our own mind that is the chief concern of the president's present Satipatthana, for the purposes of which the actual mental states listed serve as aids or exemplifications. Earlier, uh, this is me talking now, I'm not, not uh, Analio. Earlier I talked about the Vedanas, feeling tones of pleasing, not pleasing, or neutral, and the Buddha's warning about how thoughts and habits of mind proliferate if we don't give ourselves time to recognize the push of Vedanas coloring our experience. To me, lust, which may or not mean, which may or may not actually mean in a sense sexual desire, well, that's my usual understanding, uh, corresponds to the first step of proliferation. That is how we carry, carry things beyond wanting, uh, you know, we have a, a pleasant vedana and then we let it proliferate into uh, desire that becomes more embracing and, and takes up more of our mental capacity. Anger is a bit further afield but still in line with the proliferation of unpleasantness to avoidance to anger. Um, Analio writes that uh, as follows, whenever a distraction occurs, it could either involve some sort of desire, and this is distraction in the, the sense of, um, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm, doubling back on myself. When a distraction occurs, it could either involve some form of desire or lust, or else be related to the presence of some degree of aversion or anger. 
The third alternative is when the mind is just ambling around, a condition of distraction, not prominently colored by lust or anger. So the first two have gone away, but you could still be just ambling around mentally, and that can constitute a manifestation of delusion. Um, I would suggest in a slightly different way that just as a neutral tone, a neutral feeling tone or, or Vedana uh, is a special case, as I was saying before, that, that, that it, it flips immediately into a kind of a pain. Um, uh, because, um, okay, yeah, because the uh, neutral tone Vedana uh, generates a kind of pain reaction that we call boredom, I would say that analogously, uh, delusion is a kind of a special case. Lust and anger pull us into the world pool of, of reactivity, as we know, uh, but delusion, particularly the delusion of the separate self, which I mentioned a little bit earlier about, um, in which the Buddha really had as a focus, uh, is more like the scaffolding that lust and anger and other sort of things hang on. It's the, it's the primal delusion uh, and like the ocean that the whirlpool of reactivity arises in. The Buddha said that we, that we are born wrapped in delusion and that only by recognizing that condition can we start to peek through the wrappings. You know, to, to, in in uh, recovery terms, you have to acknowledge that you've got a problem first, right? So and that's what he is pointing to. Analeo seems to agree. He says the employment of these three categories helps to build a bridge from the contemplation of feelings, in particular to feelings of a worldly type. And I skipped over the section that he was writing about the distinction between worldly and unworldly react reactivity to feelings. Uh, just because we don't have a month to talk about this. Um, when lust is present in the mind, chances are that it comes accompanied by worldly feelings. Similarly, when anger arises, chances are that such a rising is accompanied by worldly painful feelings. When delusion arises in turn, chances are that worldly neutral feelings are present in the mind. Working with this relationship can offer considerable support for recognizing the arising of these detrimental states. I'm still quoting on Analyon there. Uh, such recognition has to do with a basic task required by contemplation of states of mind. This task is to see through a particular train of thought and its related associations in order to discern the underlying mental current. For mindful recognition of our present mental state, the requirement is above all a clear recognition without getting involved in the details of whatever train of thought the related associations are taking place. So, uh, a reminder, the question is, how is the mind? Not what is my mind focused on, but how is the mind? To continue quoting, uh, since, since it is often precisely these details that get us hooked and caught up in a particular chain of thoughts, achieving such recognition is more easily said than done. Recognizing the feeling tone of our current experience often help, uh, offers help for this task. It grounds awareness in the effective tone of our current experience. I'm sorry, it all. Uh, it, it, it grounds awareness in the effective reality of the present moment and thereby draws attention to our subjective involvement in whatever is happening. In this way, we learn to attend to the baseline condition of the mind, ask how the mind is, rather than to the details of particular thoughts. We usually give all our attention to the outside world in the narrow band of what's right in front of us, uh, ignoring the vast quantities of what's actually present to us in our experience, if we could just widen our gaze, but we just focus on that's right before us. Um, and we ignore the effective domain of our experience, as, as Analia calls it, 
which is shaping what we naively see as the reality in front of us. Such a restricted range of mental vision, Analeo writes, is a habit rather than a necessity. The mind is not by nature limited in a manner comparable to the human eyes. We have eyes that focus in a little area and then you know, we can perceive some other things, but to really see them fully, we have to move our heads, we have to shift everything around. But the mind is not like that, he says. The mind by nature is not limited in a manner comparable to the human eyes. Actualizing this potential uh, requires stepping back from too narrow a focus of attention and allowing our awareness to become more comprehensive. In this way, we learn to apperceive, to perceive about perception, the how of experience alongside its what. So again, the focus is on how is the mind, not necessarily the details, and in fact, trying not to get into the details of what we're, of what we're struggling against. He says that we have been getting training in perceiving our mind and mental states through the, the previous Satipatthanas of anatomy and the Vedanas. So and that, that's pretty plain to me. Start with the body, see how it feels, see how it feels to look at it from the perspective of its constitution in, in anatomy, its dissolution and death, its uh, it, the, the way that uh, our feelings uh, are impermanent and so on. Uh, those, are, those are wonderful trainings that are good days. Um, he says, now the task is to continue further in the same inward direction by tending to that which knows the body, that which knows the feelings, the mind itself and how it is. He gave, uh, in something that I didn't quote earlier, he gave an example of holding a book. So he says, in the example of holding a book in our hands, um, attention proceeded from the touch sensation of the book to feeling the hands that were touching the book. Um, in line with the overall thrust of the present Satipatthana, attention can now turn further inward to that which knows the experience of holding the book in the hand. And uh, you know, that doesn't that sounds a little difficult at first, but it but I experience it as something I can get to pretty quick. A great aid in doing so, he says, comes from recognizing those mental states that don't have anger or lust in them. So he's saying, you know, although the instruction given by the Buddha is, I recognize when I have anger, I recognize when I have lust, and I recognize when I don't have anger and I don't have lust. He says, emphasize that last part. Know your mind as an open space <coughs> without that that focus on the individual things. And that's an aid in, in then coming back when, you're, when you have anger or desire that seems problematic to you, come back to it then from the open space. And I'm gonna uh, talk about this some more. It's also an avenue for joy. An avenue for joy. Recognizing I don't have anger. Exactly, and I'm actually gonna talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and this capacity to, you know, like I was saying this morning, we have to stop and like put our hands over our hearts when we're remembering and something that matters to us. Remember a time that uh, a friend helped us where the support of another person was important to us. That, it, that, we, that those will just slide away and they'll be registered as not important in the way our brain is set up. But if we stop and make some gestures to do that, it really helps to turn those into tools that can help us in the future as well. So throughout, uh, throughout awareness that a particular mental state has arisen binds its complement in awareness of its eventual passing away. The two in combination make it clear that it is indeed the nature of any mental state to arise and pass away. And I'm quoting Amalio here. It is of considerable importance that the need, evident in the list of mental states, as well as in the refrain, we haven't talked about the refrain, but there's, there's a refrain in which the monks are responding to the 
Buddha in the, uh, in the sutra. Uh, evident in the list of mental states, as well as in the refrain, uh, the need to direct attention to the passing away of a defiled mental state. It's important to not overlook that. And I'm going to talk about this language of defiled in just a second. But, but again, the thing is to recognize that we do have the capacity that naturally arises to recognize when these things are no longer being a problem for us. And it may, it may happen 150 times a second, or it may happen once a year. Uh, the task of mindfulness is not only to draw attention to the, present, to the presence of a defilement, it similarly involves giving attention to the absence of a defilement. We can savor the condition of the mind at such times. We can get a feel for its texture and familiarize ourselves with it. We can experience for ourselves how much more pleasant such a condition is when compared with, he says, with a defiled state of mind, but I will say, in a, in a situation where we are struggling with a thought. Familiarizing ourselves with the difference between the presence and absence of this stressful defilement holding in terms of the texture and flavor of the mind will make it intuitively clear why the latter is preferable to the former. So I, I think that the thing is, is just what Kim was just pointing to, that there's a natural joy in, in realizing you can relax. I, you know, I, I'm actually, relative to where I was a second ago, I'm in a more relaxed state because I'm not struggling with that definition of, of what's bad. Um, and, and reading this last part, I am reminded, you know, that, that we read this Shin Shin Ming in the mornings. And what is uh, uh, the author of the Shin Shin Ming? Shinkan, something like that. Farmer's terrible. Yeah, I should know this. At any rate, Sing, Sing. Okay, Sing Khan. So I've I've heard it pronounced differently with the C H sound with the with the C. Uh, but um, I'm reminded that he says, "What is it when we decide that something is good is." And something is bad. What is that? Make a hair's breadth of difference. Is that what you're referring to? Say it again. What is it? Whenever we make a hair breadth of distinction. Is that, was that? There's that. Well, so uh, the quote I have is the struggle between good and evil well, is primal, what? Is it primal disease of the, the primal mind. disease of the mind. So we have other sources that are that are pointing to a different approach, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, in Mahayana Buddhism, there's a different language around this, this kind of mental space as being more, open, more naturally open and free. And, and that the difficulties that we encounter are seen as self-generated rather than good or evil, right? but just things that we struggle with and that we can lay that struggle down. Um, as un I have another kind of differentiation also from the, the, the what we've been reading in the Sariputana Sutta, as unfathomable and, and engaging as it is, I, I often have noted that it's missing something. There's no explicit mention of compassion. You know, like, don't we have to? Isn't the Buddha talking about compassion and connecting with other people? doesn't come up explicitly in this. It seems very inwardly focused, very much, I would say, in the in what seen through Mahayana eyes is in the Theravada tradition of, of singular focus on a one by one enlightenment rather than rela relationality. However, An Analayo says, although it's not explicitly mentioned, there is uh, uh, in the contemplation of the mind, a way to bridge the gap. He says, a particular importance in relation to such personal transformation that I was describing as a one person centered sort of thing. In uh, a particular importance in relation to such personal transformation, I believe, is a genuine opening of the heart 
to the qualities of kindness and compassion. In my personal view, he says, such opening of the heart is a better measuring rod for progress in our practice than having extraordinary experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like going aha all the time. It's whether you're connected with other people. In order to encourage this dimension of practice and also as a way of mirroring the Buddha's own unswerving quest for awakening, I suggest introducing a formal element of setting our intention at the beginning of each formal sitting. This could be an aspiration along the line. May I progress on the path of liberation for my own benefit and the benefit of others. So here we are coming very close to the language of the, of the chants that we use and, and so on. In the book, Buddha's Brain, which I quoted maybe 50 times over the last 15 years, uh, by R Richard Hansen and Richard Mendius, the, offers, the authors offer evidence from neuropsychology that what Analayo is saying is true. They talk about two parts of the brain very close together, the insula and the um, anterior cingulate cortex. And they say, when you're sitting in meditation and paying attention to your body, to the, to the present moment experience, you, you are directing energy in whatever form to those areas. And he says, the more aware you are of your own emotional and body states, the more your insula and anterior cingulate cortex activate. And that makes you better at reading others. Uh, and in effect, the limbic network that has to do with uh, self-protection and then also with connection with others that produces your, the limb, limbic networks that produce your feelings also begin to make sense of the feelings of others and connect with the feelings of others. Uh, so it's, it is a strengthening of compassion. So literally by sitting quietly, and focusing on your present moment experience, you will awaken compassion just because there's this kind of energy leak that goes from one part of the brain into the other. So uh, I'm gonna just kind of wrap up at this point. There's a vast amount of material in the Satipatthana meditation on the mind and mental states. Um, it turns out that it's, you know, you talk about a couple of mental states and then the Buddha says, well, there's the six things of that and the seven things of this and the 12 this. And it branches off in, in uh, astonishingly numerous directions. And it would take weeks to do just even a cursory introduction. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, and Kim and I are going to talk about uh, some other areas tomorrow. Meditation that leads to open awareness. Meditation on the seeds of wisdom and insight. And plus appreciating joy, as Kim just mentioned. And how that naturally arises within our meditation. Uh, sorry. Um, so I'm a little bit confused because when you talk about mental states, uh -huh. you only mentioned three and they're right. all negative. Right. Greed, anger, and uh, delusion. Delusion. Right. So is it is it the your view or the Analio or the Buddha's view that those are the only ones that there are? No. Not only that, but as an Analio emphasize in which I probably went over too fast. The really important thing is not those things there. Those are big tent poles, mm -hmm. you know, that we can watch out for. Right. But the important thing is not is, is not those particular things, and definitely not the details of them. But rather, one, the passing away of them, you know, we can watch how they are there, and then they go away. Mm -hmm. And that that Passing away is an important part of the meditation. And the other thing is, um, let's see, how does he put it? The other thing is savoring the condition of the mind where these mental states don't happen. So by, by recognizing when we have a mind that is not dominated by one of those three mental states, and in, and in particular, the delusion, you know, like how do we, stop from selfing all the time. Uh, that's a term that gets used over and over again, Analio uses it.
but how, do, how is it that we can recognize that we're not selfing, you know? Um, and that's, those are the, those are the real aspects of the meditation to, to emphasize rather than the mental states that are set up as the signposts at the beginning. It's kind of like the opposite. You have these yeah. three, three things, and then you have the yeah. not having those three things. Yeah. So, so this but, is, but isn't it true that if the, if there were positive states, they would arise and they would also go away? And or is it that the negative ones uh, activate us so strongly that that's the ones they're emphasizing? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I believe it's more like the latter than the former, but um, I'd have to spend about a year thinking about that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, has anybody else got a question along that line or before we turn to an activity? Alan, Alan, what do you think? No, but you're muted. I thought that my response was the same as Joel. Good question <laughs> <laughs> about the the joy the joyous aspects of mind. I don't know. I mean, it, it, I'd have to think about it a year also. And it's the whole impermanence, the whole impermanence thing going on, which can be terrifying and also reassuring. Mm -hmm. Um, and and there and then equanimity comes in there. So yeah, yeah, I agree. Totally agree with Joel. It, it would take a year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, mean, and, and, I, I think what Ellen is pointing to is because it is truly worth pondering okay. and, and instructive to ponder. Uh, it's a great question, uh, and that in this case, I believe that what he's saying is. Focus on the passing away of these states because it will open the vista to you. Mm -hmm. You won't have the, the tunnel vision. Uh, will, you know, if you start by thinking, oh, I'm really happy, you might be upset if you, I mean, you're pretty much guaranteed to be upset when that passes away and you can't, and you can't grasp it anymore, right? right. So that's, that's the other side of the coin. But, in in starting with something so seemingly negative by being able to to uh, watch it passing away then all of a sudden you're in a more open space and that that is beginning to align with the mahayana vision the mind does naturally open and free i mean how did it get open well it was already open you know we're just not like putting furniture in the way or, or something yeah to me it's like it seems like they're so seductive, so they have to be mentioned. Whereas the joy is just there. I don't know. I have to think about it too for five years. <laughs> Can I say yeah. one thing? One thing. Yes. Yeah. Then I'll almost anything else. So a big <laughs> step here is from the actual situation to the mental state. It's kind of like what Joko Beck calls labeling. Mm -hmm. And that that there's a lot of relief there going from this particular situation where someone just ran into my car to I'm feeling anger. And then the next, you walk down the street and you see a beautiful flower and then you're not then you can say to yourself, not this flower is beautiful, but oh, now I'm not feeling anger. So it's mm -hmm. moving from the label, you know, with the labeling. Mm -hmm. So I, I think once you move, do make that movement, then you really made a big step. So when you're talking about this, what I'm thinking about is Flint's presence in teachings over the years, how there is this real sense of equanimity tinged, just tinged with this smilingly mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's jumping up and down with joy or anything else, but it's like there's this presence that is not holding on to anything, either the joy or the disturbance. And I, I think for me, that's what it relates to is that 
it's like in recovery, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. the, whether it's good, bad, neutral, this too shall pass. So what does that leave you with? Leaves you with the openness. But it's much easier or harder or more value, whatever, when you're thinking about a difficult situation, mm -hmm. that that will pass away. With the joy, it's like, it's almost like, oh, good, I'm happy. Um, you know, it's like, this is great. But with, when you're really challenged with something, whether it's physical or mental or something outside yourself, a family member or something, mm -hmm. that just seems to take over your whole life. Mm -hmm. And so when you can, to me, when you can say, this too shall pass, this will pass. Mm -hmm. And when the joy comes, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. It isn't it great while it's here? Mm -hmm. Or that you ever had it. Or that you ever had it. That's right. Or that you ever had it. That's, mm -hmm. a, to me, that's probably a foundational aspect of my life right now. Mm -hmm. That I ever had it. Mm -hmm. Lisa, would you yep. speak? Come on. Thank you. Um, so something that has been occurring to me over the last couple of days um, that's related to this, or I make a connection with it, is a, the very powerful experience of openness and finding nothing to cling to when Flint read Hannah Emerson's poem, for those of you who were in inquiry. And for me, it's like, oh, this is beyond, uh, it's beyond any, there's nothing to hold on to. So it introduced me to a really unique, for me, a really unique state of, I guess you would call feeling mind, where, oh, this is the experience of no emotion in a way. It's, uh, I, I don't know if any of you heard that poem, but everybody listening to it, we were just stunned. And Hannah Emerson is autistic. So automatically that puts another really interesting um you know, aspect in there. But I guess for me, I'm saying I learned, I learned, uh, I learned that there might, what that feeling, that experience might be like of letting, of just observing. I could go on, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Well, does it feel okay to move on to the activity? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me just quickly read through this. So I think we've got time. I, I picture it will take about five minutes to get into the groups, groups of four, and then we'll have 20 minutes for the activity. It's sit with five minutes, uh, sit for five minutes, and this will be in the chat in each of the rooms. Marla's got it to share. Sit for five minutes. First, pay attention to your mental states and take note when they involve grasping or aversion. You might want to call it lust and anger or something like that. Note how such states show up in your body. For the first, uh, and then for the last minute or so of the five minutes, turn your attention to the spacious big mind that such thoughts arise in. And just see if you feel any different anywhere in your body or how your mind feels contemplating a more open space. Uh, and then in the group, take two minutes each to share your experience with the others in your group, and then use the remaining time to reflect back what you have heard from others. <coughs> okay?